Welcome everyone. Uh, this is MLSS 2020. Um, uh, we will start with showing our slides, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Super. Okay. So thanks you. Thank you all for joining uh, to this uh, uh, this year's machine learning summer school organized from Tübingen, uh, which was supposed to take place in Tübingen, but as we all know, uh, the world has decided to move in a different direction. Um, we had a lot of discussions how we would react to this. Uh, we all know that machine learning summer schools very much depend on and, and live uh, on uh, uh, close interactions of people. And, and many of you or many people in the field actually met at machine learning summer schools. Many friendships are forged and uh, collaborations are started. And uh, the truth is for us, it, it felt totally unconceivable that uh, we would do something like this virtually. Uh, but then, then through many discussions, we noticed and we also felt that uh, nobody knows how long this uh, uh, special situation is going to last. And uh, we thought we have to somehow defy it and, and continue our lives and try to make the best out of it. And uh, uh, as we, we're all learning how to do these kind of online events, we did the same also. Uh, uh, we organized a number of events uh, of uh, machine learning people working on uh, COVID problems. And uh, as you start organizing these things, you learn certain things. You notice that some things work, some things don't work. You also notice that some things are actually quite convenient uh, and it can be maybe even better than online than in person. So the whole thing is an experiment and uh, hopefully it will also, it will help uh, contribute towards uh, bringing the community together in this difficult time, uh, continuing our work, uh, some of which also can hopefully contribute to solving this crisis and solving other crises. Uh, and uh, I think we have a, we have a truly uh, international light up here. Uh, the, the, the history of machine learning summer schools is already truly uh, international. You see this, uh, slide here. Hopefully, you can all all see it. Um, we had machine learning some schools on on all uh, uh, continents other than Antarctica, um, with, with a, a certain cluster here in Europe, uh, quite a few in Australia, but also many in North America, South America, and uh, uh, East Asia and uh, Africa. So um, we're very happy and lucky and proud that we can organize the next one here uh, online. And uh, machine learning summer schools offer a platform uh, to follow uh, lectures on the latest and greatest, but also uh, of a tutorial in the nature in uh, AI and machine learning. Uh, it's uh, to some extent also an outlet to present your own work, to engage in scientific discussions, uh, uh, start collaborations, and as I mentioned already, uh, networking is a big issue. Maybe if we move to the next slide, and um, a little bit about the history, so. Uh, the schools, uh, they kind of started, uh, I think, in a discussion between Alex Mola and myself. Alex at the time was at the Australian National University. And that, that uh, meant we organized the very first one there in uh, Canberra, Australia. Uh, but then the concept took off quickly and many different teams organized machine learning summer schools. And we basically just provided the, the umbrella, uh, the web page, and uh, we gave people advice how to do it. But Basically, each machine learning summer school is an autonomous enterprise. And uh, here you see a picture from the, the last one that we held here in Tübingen, which was a great experience. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Yes, so uh, this is the, sum, uh, the webpage, mlss.cc. So you see the overall list where uh, events have taken place. So the, uh, this, this year, this is the first one. There's gonna be another one in Indonesia. Uh, uh, next, uh, or a little bit more than a month from now. So we try to space the summer schools such that their spatial temporal distance, or traditionally we have tried to space them such that the spatial temporal distance is uh, 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 reasonably large, uh, which means either they are separated in time or in space or in both. Um, if we move to the next slide, uh, now getting more concrete about this year's summer school. Um, so we have a number of sponsors, uh, most of whom we already uh, uh, found before we decided to go virtual, but we were very happy that uh, people went along uh, with 
our decision to go virtual and, and continue to sponsor us. And, and we hope that uh, maybe some of this uh, sponsorship money we can still use uh, if and when we uh, do a real physical event, which is still in the stars, we don't know, but we, we still hope that we can somehow physically meet all of you uh, out there uh, watching us in cyberspace right now. And uh, so it's organized uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems uh, with partners, uh, Cyber Valley, uh, local tipping and uh, research uh, and, and, and uh, sort of impact uh, group uh, trying to uh, uh, connect different things to artificial intelligence uh, uh, sponsored by the university, by Max Planck and by several companies here, uh, and also co-organized by at least the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligent Systems, whose, whose t-shirt I'm wearing today. <laughs> so let's move to the next slide. So um, uh, Jung, I don't know, maybe maybe it's a good time for you to, to take over or? Sure, sure. So our, we have one platinum sponsor, uh, Bloomberg Engineering, and they will give a machine learning tech talk on July 8th uh, during our lunch time. So please come join us. And uh, there will be also two virtual booth sessions on July 7th uh, during the coffee breaks. So also uh, come join and then uh, see what, uh, what kind of ML research they are working on. Um, I will also talk about a little bit of application statistics um, we got a record-breaking number of applications. It was about 1,300. So it was a lot of applications and uh, we accepted um, about 182 uh, participants. So we have about 14% acceptance rate. Um, and here I show the uh, occupation of the particip participants and also uh, gender, female, male, and prefer not to say. Um, so you can see a lot of female participants here um, compared to last year's. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, residence con country, the country of residence, you see there are nine, 39, 30, 39 uh, countries, uh, different countries. And um, I mean, what's interesting to see here is that uh, we were trying to diversify the uh, participants in terms of um, where they are from. Um, and you see five different uh, countries from Africa, for instance. Okay, uh, we, because this is uh, virtually uh, done, we were wondering when we have to put our event. So we ask our participants when they prefer to have activities, lectures and so on. And we found that about 44% of participants are from the uh, Central European time zone, which is convenient for us. But I mean, we cannot just ignore that small portion of people who live in West Coast in North America and also Asia and Australia, right? So by taking this into account, we divide our daily schedule into th three chunks. Um, as you can see here, yeah, these are three chunks. And um, so that the morning sessions are convenient for uh, people who live in Asia and Australia and midday probably is also convenient for Europeans and uh, the evening sessions are convenient for the people who live in the uh, west coast of uh, North America. And then each chunk has exactly the same uh, structure. So the, it starts with the lecture and then there's a break and then different uh, type of activities like uh, round tables and uh, speed datings or poster sessions. Um, the second week has the same structure. Our MLSS consists of the following um, activities. The first activity is lectures. Werner, do you want to take over? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, yeah, I just noticed. Yeah, so we're very happy to have a very strong uh, list of speakers uh, and I think we've all of them chronologically um, uh, so we have a very long list of speakers and um, putting together the schedule is maybe the most important part of organizing the MLSS and uh, I think we had a lot of discussions uh, in our organization team uh, on what would be the, the ideal uh, slate of speakers and a lot of communication with speakers and uh, almost everybody we invited said yes, already at a time when uh, we still believe that this is going to be a physical event. So people were uh, prepared to, to fly over for this summer school. 
uh, sadly, this is not taking place now, um, but uh, just imagine the amount of uh, CO2 that's now being saved by all these people uh, giving these lectures from home. So maybe that's one positive way to think of it. And hopefully we'll, we'll get to meet at some point, maybe at a place where uh, many of us are traveling anyway. So uh, um, I'm not gonna, uh, or maybe I'll briefly mention the name. So YYT, uh, Michaela van der Schaar, Francis Bach, Stefan Bauer here locally, Joshua Benjo, uh, Michael Bronstein, Nicolo Cesia Bianchi, Marco Couturi, Konstantinos Daskalakis, Peter Dayan, who's also local now, Arthur Gretton, uh, Moritz Hart, Shakir Mohamed, Sonia Petrone, uh, Doina Precup, and Maria Schult. I mean, let's, shall we move on to the next slide? So uh, I think, Mijung, you, you're better at explaining this part. Yeah. So the lectures will be done on Zoom. So you join the Zoom sessions as you did today. Um, uh, the, each link to these sessions are listed, is listed on our calendar embedded on um, virtual MNSS webpage. This is actually unfortunately only for participants, um, but we uh, live stream our uh, lectures on YouTube. Most of them uh, depends on the uh, agreement uh, between us and the speakers. And the, uh, we have a Reddit sub, uh, subreddit uh, for MLSS 2020. This is public one. So anybody who has a question, uh, they can go there and write uh, questions and people who know the answer will probably answer. And upon joining these Zoom sessions, you are uh, muted and your camera is off. Um, so if you're a participant and you want to talk, then raise your hand and we will unmute you and you can turn on the camera if you wish. Okay. Uh, and Georges will talk about roundtables and other activities. Hello everyone, I'm Georges. I'm a member of the organizing team and I will uh, present some of the activities that we plan for you. So probably everybody know that the, the biggest problem in these virtual activities or virtual events is the socializing and networking part, how we can solve this problem. Uh, one of the, so we have several activities to do that. One of them is the round tables. So the format of the round tables is that each speaker has two to three round table sessions, uh, su such that most of the participants are able to chat with them. Uh, we're going to have the round tables through Zoom and you're going to leave your questions in our uh, Reddit private channels. So please give us your Reddit ID in the form, as we already told you. Uh, the round tables, they're going to be one roll one hour long, and they're gonna be three times per day, and could be many round tables in parallel, uh, at most two, not many. Um, so the, the, the structure is gonna be as follows. Uh, we're gonna start the, the round table, and then the moderator will ask probably questions from the Reddit that are highly voted. And then you're gonna activate your cameras and your microphones, and you're gonna have the chance to chat with the speaker for one hour. Uh, yeah, so let's go to the next activity. And I would like to thank very much the speakers, by the way, for the willingness to participate in the roundtables because it takes too much time from their schedule. Uh, the, the second activity that we plan, uh, this is the speed dates. Uh, the format is the following. We shuffle the people randomly and we made groups by respecting your uh, constraints with the time zone. And these groups, they are supposed to meet each other and make friends. Uh, it, the, the, the group is going to be three minutes, uh, 30 minutes. We're going to have six times per uh, six slots per day. they are going to be eight concurrent sessions per slot. And they're going to be about six people per group. Um, uh, you, as, as I said, you're going to have to attend six of them. But feel free and we encourage you to, to join to as many as you wish. Uh, because the, the idea of this uh, activity is to bring me in contact to as many as possible of the rest of the participants. We're going to use Mattermost to, to make this, uh, this session. So you go, you find the group that you want to participate. Then you go to Mattermost, you find the room, and then you click uh, the big blue button, which activates the, the call. There are no strict rules about the, the speed dating. Just try to be friendly and uh, communicate and introduce to you, yourself to the rest of the participants. Let's go to the final activity I'm going to talk about. This is the poster Q&A. This is similar to the speed dating, but the difference here is that in each group, there's going to be a person who's going to be the leader of the Q&A session, and he, will, uh, he or she will try to reply to the questions 
about his or her poster that the other people have hopefully watched beforehand. So each of you have recorded a video of maximum 10 minutes. This is in our virtual website. You can find them, you can watch the videos. And then you have to participate in these live Q&A sessions in order to ask questions about the poster. Again, here we prepared some groups for you that we we tell you that you have to attend, but feel free and we encourage you to attend as many as possible, especially if there are some posters that you are really interested in. One question is that, okay, why I went to a poster or why I should go to a poster that I'm not really interested in the topic? And the answer is the following, because usually in the summer schools, you get to know people, you see their posters and you get to know also about their research. And this is how you build your small network which starts expanding. So it's not necessarily that you have to be really into the research domain of the, the poster that you have to attend. But the idea is that you have to meet the person, introduce yourself and learn something about the research that they do. Keep in mind that some of the speakers, they might appear in your poster Q&A session, which it might be funny. And also we're gonna have some volunteers that they're gonna moderate or try to help you with a, with a live Q&A session. Again, we're gonna use Mattermost for this activity and then Mijang will take over with the rest of the activities. Thank you. Thank you. And we also prepared uh, many social events, uh, which will be held on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Um, we will use the Zoom um, as before. And one nice thing, I guess I will illustrate the, um, the events we prepared. So virtual pop quiz. Um, here, you know, we want to simulate the situation where you go to a pub and then there is a, some pop quiz and, you know, basically you have to prepare your beer, you know, and then attend this session. And then we also have international cooking event uh, where people cook their own international, their, their own national cuisine. And then, you know, you talk and eat and mm, this is delicious, you know, something like that. And then there's also no equipment workout. Basically, you leave your desk and be active with your peers with a body weight on your workout. And we have a, a tutorial for the game of Go. Um, and also we have a tubing and treasure hunt, which is basically um, the, the way we want to simulate uh, how you could experience tubing. And so some of our volunteers went out this weekend to uh, make some videos at really nice spots in, uh, in tubing. Uh, so if you are here, you would probably go there and uh, experience this. So by joining this session, you can also experience this. Uh, and also there's a very exciting Zumba class prepared for you. So I hope you uh, uh, enjoy um, most of this and then uh, take the best out of it. And we also have two uh, chat room and uh, social media. Um, this is also for uh, participants only. Um, probably most of you are already invited and then joined our chat room on Mattermost. And uh, there is an announcement channel. This is a public channel, so you can just join. Please take, uh, um, pay attention to this uh, announcement channel because we will uh, communicate with you here, mostly. Uh, and we have um, a, channel for, uh, a channel that's assigned to each speaker. So it starts with le le lecture and then um, the, the title of the lecture. So Shakir Mohammed, for instance, he's already active, quite active in this. So, you can go to each of these. For instance, Yosha Benjo, uh, his um, chat room is uh, here. And our volunteers will actually go to these channels regularly to see if the speakers are engaged. If they are not, then we will bother the speakers to be more active, okay? And um, if you have any uh, question, if you don't know where to go at this time, yeah, you go here to uh, MLSS general support and then you can get help. Um, and also we have, as Giorgio said, there is a poster Q&A room and also speed dating room. And check your schedule on the virtual MLSS webpage and then go to the designated room for you. Um, and there is social media. Um, we have a private group. Please come join. Uh, and then a public page. Uh, we also have a Twitter account. Uh, this is a basically a screenshot of this. Tweet, a tweet that we made uh, uh, two weeks ago when we did this test run and people are so excited about our MLSS. Okay, and here virtual MLSS will be uh, introduced by Witawat. Witawat? Yep, so let me share my screen. 
So I hope you all can see the um, website. So um, my name is Wittawat. I'm part of the organizing team. So just to give a brief introduction to the virtual event website. So this is the virtual event website that you see here. So the first page home here, uh, you will see a Google calendar here um, that you see all the activities offered by the MLSS. And you can also add all this to your calendar. Just click this button at the lower right. Um, and if you don't remember what we tell you in this session, just check the instructions here on the first page. So it has everything that you need to know. Um, and on the virtual event website, again, um, each selected participant has his or her own profile page. You can update your information in the form that we sent. Um, and so on this page, live QA sessions, this page lists all uh, live QA sessions that you can attend. So if you are assigned to attend a session, please do attend. If not, uh, it is optional and you are free to attend any sessions. So, so for example, if you click this session, um, it will take you to this page that shows, okay, this is the title of the poster. So we use the term poster, but actually there's no physical poster. It is just video presentation. And you will see the abstract, you will see the embedded video, and you can also leave comments at the bottom of the, the embedded video here. And same for speed dating, you can find all um, speed dating sessions that you are free to attend any sessions again. And if you have concerns or questions, please so check this page, contact. Uh, it lists all the contact channels that you should use to contact us. And that's all for the virtual event website. So I will give the stage back to Mijong. So Mijong, please uh, share, yep. Uh, you're muted. Contributors. Okay. The MLSS 2020 organization team consists of these many people. Um, chairs. It's me, Mi Jung Park. Uh, I will actually not read the last names because they are not easy to pronounce. Witawa, Giorgio, and Bernard. And event management team consists of Maria and Barbara. And uh, Matthias was supporting us uh, as an administration their support and logo design was done by Anna and thumbnail and content creation was done by Alejandro. Alejandro uh, was really helpful in making a lot of uh, nice videos. You will see uh, later on uh, what I mean. Um, and uh, also PR, Vlog, we have our own um, um, way of uh, advertising our own events. Uh, and this was created by Valerie and Anika. And of course, I mean, you can imagine how much work we had to put to make this event as virtual event, right? So from the beginning, the application evaluation was not easy to do just among a few of, a few of us. So we had to get volunteers to do um, application evaluation. And now you are gonna see all of our volunteers appearing here and there uh, during lecture sessions, round table, speed dating, poster Q&A and social events and also we, get, we got a lot of help from our volunteers for developing this virtual MLSS webpage and chat platform maintenance and social media moderation. So they are all done by our volunteers. Uh, so we thank them for their enthusiasm uh, and uh, incredible amount of work. Um, so Bernard, do you want to say something here? Okay, yeah. So I, I, I would like to thank especially you and Georgios and Vitavat very much. I think this has been a lot of fun already. And, and I should say, uh, so when we had these discussions, should we go virtual or not? I think at some point I would say, well, how bad can it be? We just, uh, we do it via Zoom and it, it's all going to work out. And then you guys told me, look, we either do it properly or we don't do it. And uh, now, and or over these last months, and also now after seeing this presentation and what, everything that has come together, I think it has become clear, maybe it was clear to you already before, but it has finally also become clear to me how much uh, work this is to do it properly. And I think it's going to be a very exciting experiment, uh, maybe a one of a kind in terms of how much interaction there will be. So uh, let's all try to make the most most of that. 
And, yeah. and uh, one one other sentence I wanted to say, just to make sure, because I think there will also be many people watching on on YouTube. Um, so sometimes we use the term participant uh, in this uh, uh, talk. So participant uh, is sort of technically referred to those people who applied to be part of it. And uh, as Mijung showed you before, it was quite a competitive procedure to be part of it. And of course, the, uh, so the original reason why this is competitive is that our lecture room only has a certain size. Uh, now, virtually in principle, you can have more people. And I think we maybe we have slightly more. Um, but at the same time, if you want to do all these interactive things, it's clear that you, you cannot scale to the internet. Uh, so if people want to have access to the speakers, etc., uh, that doesn't scale arbitrarily. But uh, we felt that the lectures do scale. So that's why we have this uh, dual format that we have the, sort of the participants in the narrow sense uh, uh, that had to apply and uh, that have access to all these interactive formats. Uh, but we also have the worldwide participants who watch the lectures on YouTube, and uh, they are equally welcome. Uh, but unfortunately, they uh, they have a, a somewhat uh, limited interactive experience. Uh, they have the YouTube videos, and I think they have the access, as Mijung described before, to some some forum. So um, I encourage everybody to make the most out of it. But at the same time, also please bear with us because it's really the first time that we have done it like this. And there are bound to be many mistakes and hiccups and things are not going to work. And uh, uh, just imagine, uh, think of yourself as somebody who's part of the team helping us to debug this experience. Uh, you're not on the other side. Uh, the people organizing this were participants themselves at some point in summer schools not long ago. Uh, one day you will organize something like this. So let's think of us as a big team and, uh, and try to make the best out of it uh, and, and have... Uh, future events like this that are almost as good and almost as interactive as real events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, should we start your lecture? OK. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Do you see the slides in full size? Yes, okay. Okay, so um, we, the last uh, uh, few times that we run the machine learning summer school, we, uh, we started with a lecture which uh, typically was entitled, what is machine learning? So, uh, this is the lecture, what is machine learning? The title is slightly different this time. Uh, try to give it a little bit more structure and uh, want to explain a little bit of the progression of AI and different paradigms and different breaking points uh, uh, through the history uh, to give us a bit of a perspective of where we are now and, and maybe also what are the important uh, problems we're facing. So, um, we are here uh, hosting this school from the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. And in this institute, our long-term goal is to understand the organizing principles underlying complex behavior. And uh, here we have some videos of different types of complex behavior. So you see a blood cell in, in pursuit of bacteria. There's a frog trying to uh, catch an insect. There's a human uh, exhibiting very complex uh, visual motor behavior. It's called parkour. And finally, there's a group of humans performing a double chorus Bach cantata, which is uh, also certainly a behavior that requires a lot of intelligence, uh, as a lot of collective intelligence with non-trivial uh, interaction. Um, and uh, we are basically trying to understand what are the principles that enable this kind of behavior. And uh, uh, we try to do so uh, in a constructive approach. And I, I would like to motivate this uh, by this snapshot of the, the blackboard of uh, Richard Feynman, one of the greatest physicists of the last century. And there's this uh, famous quotation, which says, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So this uh, tells us that maybe a good way to understand things is to try to create them. And in a way that's the, the you could say that's the philosophy or that's the approach of machine learning 
uh, as a major field or, or maybe as the modern approach towards artificial intelligence. So machine learning tries to create intelligence. Uh, maybe it sometimes ends up with systems that are so complex that we don't understand the system as an artifact. Uh, but we could try to at least understand the process or the principles that lead to these systems. So what are the learning algorithms? What are the statistical guarantees that we can give uh, for those learning algorithms? Uh, what, are, what are mathematical formalizations that can tell us something about when these algorithms work and for what kind of data they work? So that's our motivation in machine learning when we do AI. And uh, I now want to uh, walk you through some aspects of the history of this. And uh, I want to start with an, an, an article from the New York Times from 1958. It's this article over here. So this was a report on a new machine called the Perceptron. And this was demonstrated by Frank Rosenblatt, a psychologist. He demonstrated that this system uh, learns from experience. He said it's the first machine that uh, would, that uh, can think like a human brain and that makes mistakes at first, but will grow wiser as it gains experience. And later on uh, in the uh, in the article, <clears throat> uh, he's also quoted as saying, or or people report that he says that later perceptions will be able to recognize people, call out their names, and translate speech in one language to speech or writing in another language. Uh, this was very far away at the time, so quite visionary of Rosenblatt to claim something like this, and it must have sounded hyperbolic to some people. Uh, but in the last decade or so, it has become clear that it maybe was not so unrealistic. So this is uh, quite remarkable, I find. And this was this work of Rosenblatt was probably the, the, the birth uh, or the starting point of uh, a field which was called connectionism, so the attempt to build synthetic brains. Now this uh, uh, happened uh, uh, in the, against the backdrop uh, or the intellectual background uh, of a field which was called uh, cybernetics. And uh, <clears throat> cybernetics, one of the founding fathers of cybernetics was uh, Norbert Wiener, uh, who wrote this classic book, Cybernetics or Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. And uh, cybernetics studied uh, or studies uh, the control and information processing in animals and machines. And the uh, focus here is on information processing because uh, um, uh, earlier on, if you look at how people try to understand the brain, uh, paradigms shift uh, through the ages. And uh, you can try to understand certain things in biological systems by uh, uh, studying how the systems process energy which is another fundamental notion. But information is something that entered the scientific scene later on, only around that time. And people got interested how to understand uh, intelligence, understand animals and humans as information processing devices rather than just as energy processing design devices. So this is uh, what started around that time. Um, it's arguably probably also the, the, the birth of uh, cognitive science. All these people were talking to each other uh, in those days. There was a series of conferences called the, the Macy uh, conferences and other important names to mention apart from Norbert Wiener, uh, are John von Neumann, Alan Turing, uh, Claude Shannon. And uh, I have this nice picture here that I'd like to show. Um, this is from, uh, these are the notes uh, from, uh, the, the notes of Warren McCulloch uh, um, for the uh, a meeting that was supposed to take place or that was organized for 1953, where he was uh, looking at different names of people that he wants to invite. And, uh, and there's also, I, I, you would recognize uh, some of those names, of course. Um, for instance, here there's Turing or Arnaud Piaget. Uh, Shannon only appeared as an alternate uh, initially, apparently. And uh, another interesting document that is preserved is the response of Turing. Uh, this is the letter of Turing. He says, I, it was very gratifying and tempting to uh, get your invitation to the Macy meeting. You certainly got a wonderful collection of people together. Uh, if it were in Europe, I should certainly try to make it, but I'm really a rather a stay at home type. And uh, so he didn't go. Uh, it's also interesting to think about, I mean, as you know, uh, Turing uh, had a, a rather uh, sad biography at the end. Um, so the conference took place in 1953 and uh, I was just uh, studying again his uh, CV last night. 
So the year before the conference, 1952, as, as some of you might know, uh, Turing, who was gay, was convicted of what, what then was called gross indecency for having a, a relationship uh, with another man. And, uh, and according to the Wikipedia page, that also meant that he was denied entry into the United States. So that might also have played a role in his uh, response. And uh, also, let me mention that the year after the Macy conference, uh, he, he died, uh, sadly, uh, probably by suicide, although it's maybe, I don't know if it's not, if it's completely proven. So um, this was these Macy conferences. And uh, so people tried to understand in this time of cybernetics, different systems, technical systems by uh, cybernetic uh, control loops. They tried to understand animals. They uh, tried to understand also humans and, and you, many of these pictures look extremely dated to us uh, you can you can see the the then current paradigms uh, all the way through this and uh, it looks funny to us uh, but i think it's very interesting to see this because and then to remind ourselves that maybe many of the things that we do now will will also look very funny and dated uh, in the future so and people even tried to apply cybernetics uh, to government. So there was a, a project run by a, a leading cybernetics researcher, Stafford Beer, uh, in, in Chile, uh, uh, sponsored by the Allende government. Um, so this is the, uh, the, the, the intellectual background. And uh, Rosenblatt, I mentioned before, who built this perceptron, the first perceptron, which was actually a physical device, I should say. Um, it had uh, eight outputs. And uh, there was something which was called the order of a perceptron. That was uh, the, the number of how many different uh, input connections uh, these association units had. And uh, the order was six in that case. In the, and, and the first layer of weights was randomly wild. Now, so what was revolutionary about this device was that it had modifiable connections learned from an error signal uh, computed on data. So if you want, this is the first occurrence of what is now called empirical risk minimization in machine learning. And, uh, and the second layer had weights that are adjustable uh, using the so-called perceptron learning rule. Now, uh, Minsky and Papert will come back to them later on. Uh, they uh, later report that uh, this scheme quickly took root and there were uh, quickly uh, hundreds, uh, as a hundred groups, large and small, experimenting with this uh, as a so-called learning machine. So you, you can see uh, here a slightly disapproving tone uh, in here. And now people were uh, aware relatively early on that uh, not everything could be learned this way. Uh, and the particular task that could not be learned uh, was the so-called XOR, the exclusive OR. So they noticed if you have one layer, you can do an AND, but uh, if you uh, want to learn XOR, you need a cascade of, of trainable layers. And uh, there was no training algorithm for that yet. And, and Rosenblatt uh, recognized a number of limitations uh, of perceptrons, uh, the, the learning time with the slow computers at the time. Um, as well as uh, a, a number of other issues, uh, including the question of how to train uh, multi-layer systems. And he also uh, quickly recognized that there's a certain discrepancy between uh, the object that we want to build or study and the brain, which is something biological, so biological nervous systems, uh, and uh, the digital Boolean algebra devices that we, we use to simulate those. Uh, another quite revolutionary thing at the time, and I, I, I heard this from uh, Vladimir Vatnik, who was uh, studying around or starting to study around that time in, in, uh, in Russia. Uh, this is something that spread around the globe very fast, uh, that it was possible to prove mathematical theorems about learning processes. To us, that sounds trivial, uh, but then it must have been quite, uh, quite a paradigm shift or quite a revolution and the, the most famous uh, uh, early theorem is still famous is the perceptron convergence theorem due to Novikov, uh, which says that under certain assumptions, if there's a certain, uh, nowadays we would call it a margin of separation between the two classes, uh, then we, if we use the perceptron update rule down here, uh, then it turns out we only have to run a finite number of updates and everything will then be perfectly uh, classified. So this was a shocking result uh, spreading around the globe. 
Now, around the same time, there was another revolutionary development uh, underway. <clears throat> this development was that people understood uh, uh, that computers can mo do more than just compute. They can process symbols. So uh, computers can process any kind of symbol uh, if you want. Uh, we, we could say this gave birth to the field of computer science the way we know it, because computer science is not just about calculating, of course. And, uh, and people, uh, actually, in, in those days, I should say the starting days of computer science, I think most people were interested in artificial intelligence. If you want computer science comes from artificial intelligence, people realized that this is a very powerful notion uh, to think of the process of manipulating discrete symbols. And uh, people thus hypothesized that intelligence can be reduced to such a process. And uh, the main names uh, associated with this are uh, John McCarthy, Alan Newell, Herb Simon, uh, Marvin Minsky, and others, of course. Uh, some of them Turing Award winners. And uh, this was, uh, if you want, the, the competing paradigm at the, around that time. And it's interesting to uh, read some of the people who experienced that time. So Minsky and, and Papert, who were part of the symbolic paradigm, who wrote a famous book that I'll, I'll show in the next slide, a famous book about perceptions. They said there was a, a great wave of neural network research. There were thousands of projects. Uh, the machines were very limited. Uh, by 1965, people were getting worried. Uh, they were trying to get money to build bigger machines, but they didn't seem to be going anywhere. That's when Papert and I wrote this book, and uh, and he said there was some. Uh, he admits there was some hostility in the energy behind this uh, research that led to their book, which is called Perceptrons. Uh, and part of the drive came from the fact that they thought that a lot of funding and research energy was being dissipated on misleading attempts. Uh, so that's uh, quite interesting to read. And uh, uh, Robert Hecht Nielsen, uh, who was part of the connectionist movement, uh, he describes that this campaign against connectionism was waged by means of personal persuasion, as well as by a limited circulation of an unpublished technical manuscript, which was later the Venomanist, and then published as this book here. And the book is famous for uh, the so-called XOR affair, the XOR problem. So uh, uh, the, the book has this goal. They said they, they, uh, they are involved with a somewhat therapeutic compulsion. They want to dispel what they feel to be the first shadows of a holistic or gestalt misconception that would threaten to haunt the fields of engineering and artificial intelligence. So they were worried that artificial intelligence would move into this direction, uh, uh, this sort of hand wavy direction where we, we build complicated systems that uh, holistically solve a certain problem without understanding in detail what's going on. So this is, if you want, this is a conflict that's still there in the field uh, until this present day and it uh, originated around that time. And uh, so this book, uh, Perceptrons, um, so they were uh, assuming there's one output neuron for simplicity. They also restrict the order of the association units. So how many connections are they allowed to make here on this uh, so-called retina? And then they prove uh, that uh, certain problems don't work. Uh, for instance, the parity problem, which is uh, like a generalization of the XOR problem, uh, cannot be solved unless the order of these association units equals the whole retina, which they felt is pointless because the whole point of these connections and systems is that you have parallel processing. So a um, similar argument can be made for questions of uh, finding out connectionness and uh, connectedness and figure ground separation. And they argued that trivially, if you are allowed to sequentially or serially go across the retina, you can trivially solve the parity problem. So what's the parity problem and is it important? Like if I show you a picture like this, uh, can you tell me whether there's an even or an odd number of pixels? No, probably not. I don't know. Can I, can I see votes? <laughs> it's probably, it's, it's, I think you, you get the point. This is quite, it's, it's somewhat meaningless uh, um, to ask intelligent systems, or at least naturally intelligent systems, to solve the parity problem. Uh, nevertheless, this was considered a, a major limitation of perceptrons that they couldn't solve that problem. Now, um, uh, the reception. Uh, of course, the reception on the, uh, the, the symbol, uh, symbolic AI side was uh, very positive. 
So Alan Newell, for instance, wrote, this is a great book. Uh, and uh, uh, he also writes at the end of his review, uh, I should remark, I'm not an unbiased witness. I share with Minsky in paper the common view of the appropriate shaping of computer science into a disciplined field of inquiry. So this was about, um, if you want, it was also a debate of how computer science as a field should look. Should it be a mathematical discipline or should it be something where uh, people from all sorts of different disciplines come together, build learning algorithms, maybe build systems, artifacts that they don't understand in details. And uh, uh, this is a tension that as the field of machine learning had to live with uh, uh, since these days. Now, um, perceptrons as a learning paradigm uh, came, got out of fashion uh, for multiple reasons. Symbolic AI was gaining momentum. It was the birth of computer science and computer science was extremely successful in many problems, maybe not human or animal intelligence, but many other problems. Um, Many groups left. Rosenblatt tragically died in a in a boating accident. I think he was a bit of a, a, a crazy, a, a flamboyant guy um, who had a fast boat. And uh, Alpa cut off the funding. Alpa was uh, what is now what is now called Dalpa cut off funding for neural nets. And uh, interestingly, uh, this is a quotation from Newell and Simon. Uh, this defeat of neural nets was used to legitimize symbolic AI. So uh, people thought, people said the principal body of evidence for the symbolic hypothesis is negative evidence, the absence of specific, specific competing hypothesis as to how intelligent activity might be accomplished. So I find that an unusual argument. So if we don't have a, a, a good explanation, then let's just take whatever explanation we have and uh, use uh, the, the lack of another explanation as evidence. Anyway, so uh, symbolic AI um, uh, became uh, very popular and uh, uh, symbolic AI made a number of predictions. People were very optimistic in the early days. Uh, Herb Simon predicted that within 10 years, a computer would be world champion in chess. Uh, would discover and prove an important new mathematical theorem and write music of considerable aesthetic value. So this is, uh, uh, now these predictions were not correct. Even uh, the first one was not correct. It took significantly longer than that. Um, but nevertheless, uh, symbolic AI was crucial for computer science and gave birth to the field, uh, transformed computers into symbolic processing systems uh, symbolic AI gave birth to the first high-level programming languages. Uh, and of course, this development fit together very well with the wide availability of digital computers. So there was the early optimism, uh, but then it, no, it turned out not everything worked out the way it was planned. And uh, this led to this uh, formulation uh, in the 1980s, uh, by uh, Hans Morabeck uh, and also others in similar forms uh, of what has become to be known as Morabeck's paradox. And the paradox uh, uh, basically says that uh, problems that appear difficult, such as uh, playing chess, uh, um, proving theorems, etc., uh, appear to be uh, turned out to be reasonably simple. Uh, but problems that appeared simple, such as what children uh, at the age of one year can do that and what most animals can do. Uh, uh, simple object recognition, locomotion, uh, turned out to be out of reach for uh, uh, classic AI systems. So the simple problems are hard and the hard problems are surprisingly simple. And um, hard problems of course included, I uh, vision I already mentioned also speech uh, and um, this uh, disenchantment uh, with uh, classic AI uh, brought back a new or was one of the factors bringing back neural networks. Uh, there were multiple factors. Another factor was that computing became a commodity. This is the uh, Sinclair ZX81, came out in 1981, sold one and a half million units. It was my, my first computer. Um, other fields, uh, so that there was the, the parallel distributed processing group formed by uh, uh, several psychologists and the first uh, uh, modern learning algorithms uh, started to appear, uh, including the Boltzmann machine. And of course, crucially, uh, the backpropagation method was uh, invented slash reinvented um, by a number of people. And 
uh, I'm listing some of them here. And if you go to the Wikipedia page, there's even more. And there's also some, some debate about uh, what can truly be uh, called backpropagation. Uh, some of these people developed uh, mathematically the same methods. Uh, for instance, uh, Linnein-Mar essentially developed automatic differentiation in a, a slightly different context. Uh, it's mathematically the same method, but uh, not applied to machine learning. Um, and ultimately, of course, uh, it's just an application of the chain rule. So maybe we shouldn't worry too much about who who invented it. Uh, and I think most of these people wouldn't probably wouldn't claim it for themselves alone uh, reasonably. Interestingly, so Minsky paper brought out a second edition uh, of their book, Perceptrons. Uh, they were not too impressed with backpropagation. Uh, they wrote that uh, uh, this is merely a particular way to compute a gradient. And uh, uh, so it's, it still has these basic limitations of, of hill climbing. So, uh, but uh, this time uh, there was a lot more momentum in this field and the field of machine learning started to emerge. And um, of course it, it, uh, it didn't just start at that point. So I have some older references here on this slide as well. So, uh, uh, and, and also this is not complete, of course, you could, you could go back at least to uh, Laplace and to Gauss. Uh, Laplace is the, the person who really introduced uh, Bayes' theorem in the general form. Uh, applied it to the celestial mechanics uh, uh, goes who did uh, the least squares minimization. And then in the uh, 1950s, uh, Solomonov uh, started thinking about probabilistic artificial intelligence, picture over here. Um, statistical learning theory started to emerge, interestingly also in a, in a cybernetics or control research institute uh, founded by Vapnik and Jawaninkis uh, when they were both PhD students really. Uh, late, le later led to the field of probably approximately cor correct uh, analysis or, or, or learning uh, in the US. Um, a number of physicists got into the field, uh, for instance, uh, uh, John Hopfield, um, uh, because there were some uh, interesting models from magnetism, the Ising model, uh, which turned out to be uh, interesting and powerful for modeling neural systems. Uh, Hopfield had a large influence also because he was uh, the PhD advisor of some crucial people in the field, such as uh, David Mackay and uh, Sam Browise. Both of them sadly uh, died much too young. Um, there was uh, uh, um, people understood that expert systems uh, needed to be made probabilistic. Uh, so, expert system knowledge representation that's something that uh, comes from uh, classical AI. I briefly have to close my window because someone is someone is cutting a tree outside. Wait. Okay, this should be a little better. Um, so uh, um, there were expert systems knowledge representations in classic AI. Uh, Perl and others recognized that this needed to be made probabilistic, and in order to make that consistently probabilistic. Uh, you have to come up with something that we would nowadays call base nets uh, or, or graphical models. And uh, Pearl was really the father of that field. Uh, the first uh, conference for uncertainty in AI was founded. The first uh, uh, new RIPs, uh, uh, sorry, I haven't updated this acronym yet. The first uh, neural information processing systems conference was founded. Uh, people uh, uh, did a lot of uh, fundamental work on the probabilistic foundations of machine learning. Uh, and uh, people also uh, start to connect machine learning to functional analysis and to uh, optimization. So nowadays we have a lot of tools in the, uh, uh, our toolbox contains not just probability theory, but also a lot of uh, sophisticated mathematics from functional analysis uh, and a lot of fancy algorithms from optimization. Uh, and all these things came into our field step-by-step. Step. And overall, uh, all this, this set of tools uh, eventually led to a, a decline of classical AI where the rules are shaped by humans, uh, which is less applicable if a human provides a precise model of what a program should do. And uh, instead, this field of machine learning where the rules are shaped by learning uh, went through the roof, as you can see here in the, attend in the submission numbers, or maybe it's the attendance numbers uh, of some of the main conferences in the field.
And there was a, a, an article in the MIT Technology Review also quite recently. Uh, so if we analyze uh, the words used in modern AI publications, uh, we see that the importance of words like logic and program has declined at the same time the uh, words like data and learning have uh, increased. And uh, there's also uh, more talk about performance. I guess that's probably a good thing. Uh, we are closer to reality. Our methods have to prove themselves in reality. Uh, maybe a slightly sad thing is that the word theory has gone down, but uh, we, we can try to work against that. Now, uh, machine learning turned out to be uh, particularly strong whenever we had huge data sets. And this uh, shows the performance of a machine learning system. I have to approach, I have to open, close my second window also. Okay, now it's quiet. Um, so this is a, a performance of a machine learning system on, on a problem of recognizing DNA sequences as a function of the training set size. And uh, this is a problem, this was 2006, uh, where already at that time we could surpass the human accuracy in the sense that if a human looked at this data and this data as DNA sequences and, and tried to recognize the signal that's being classified here, it's a, a certain, certain time of uh, biologically meaningful classification, uh, humans wouldn't really be able to solve this accurately. But the machines, if you, uh, uh, and, and humans are basically in this range down here, we, we wouldn't look at 10,000 or 100,000 let alone 10 million training examples. So um, this is a problem, type of data that we are not used to as humans, uh, where it's therefore reasonably easy to uh, beat human performance by automatic system that's trained on a huge training set. And these kind of problems, they have several interesting characteristics. They are often uh, quite high dimensional. And we have little mechanistic understanding uh, of these problems. Uh, as a consequence, the, we need large training sets. And interestingly, <clears throat> we have a theoretical understanding uh, that certain methods uh, are probably optimal in the limit. So if we have an infinite amount of training data, but <clears throat> the proof of these uh, results, these kinds of universal consistency results uh, depends on uh, what is called the IID assumption. So the data has to be independent and identically distributed. So this implies that there's uh, nothing changes in a problem between training and testing. And that's, uh, it sounds innocuous, but it's not such an innocuous assumption. Now here's a, a, a this was a very impressive result uh, of machine learning in modern AI uh, already five years by now, five years ago, uh, uh, where uh, and a deep neural network system uh, combined with Q-learning um, was trained to learn a set of Atari games. And it was interpreted as a form of general AI. But of course, it has to, has to be taken with a grain of salt. So the, the system has to be had to be retrained on every game. Training sets are huge. And, uh, and, and there were some clever tricks being used, such as storing data, commuting them, retraining, uh, to effectively make the problem IID. So in a way, here an AI problem was turned into a large scale pattern recognition task. And uh, I discussed this at the time in a, a commentary which appeared alongside the paper in the same issue. And uh, I think there are multiple trends at work here. One is that uh, of course we have high capacity machine learning systems. We have massive amounts of data in this case by simulation. Sometimes we can do it also by human labeling. Uh, we use, uh, uh, high performance hardware for massively parallel computation, and we have the IID settings. Now, uh, what happens if this IID assumption is violated? So here, uh, uh, this is another area where progress has been dramatic, and this is an area that can illustrate uh, these violations nicely. Uh, this is the area of uh, object recognition. So here we train systems on huge sets of labeled images, and uh, by some measure of success, so here the, the, the top output is always the correct one in these cases, so by some measure of success, uh, we can achieve human, or some people would say superhuman level performance on these uh, uh, sets. Uh, however, uh, if there are things in a test image, such as the beach or the sea, that are negatively correlated with the presence of cows in the training set, 
So if, if the training set contains this kind of images, but the test set now contains this kind of images, then the system uh, may not recognize cows anymore. And the reason for this is that machine learning is based, standard statistical machine learning is based on statistical dependencies ultimately. And it doesn't care about uh, something that we would call causality. And uh, I think when we see these examples, uh, uh, we are bothered by it because we do care about uh, more than just the statistical, statistical structure in the images. And uh, since these systems that we train nowadays uh, under the IID's assumption on huge uh, uh, training sets and uh, evaluate them on test sets taken from the same distribution, since these systems are so highly optimized uh, to a given data sets, uh, the systems turn out to be not robust with respect to, to even very small uh, violations of the IID assumptions. So if we add a tiny multiple of a random noise image or of some image that we have cleverly chosen, uh, so in this case, it's a malicious noise uh, to a test image, we get something that looks the same to a human, so the change is imperceptible, but the system may suddenly classify this little pig as an airliner. So this is uh, quite uh, um, disconcerting um, that this tiny violation of the IID assumptions so we, we uh, slightly change this image is no longer an image that strictly comes from the same distribution uh, uh, breaks things. And uh, um, let me see. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you a few more uh, examples of uh, how causality can play a role. Let's see. Maybe starting with this one. So this is a study about coffee drinking, uh, where interestingly, so it uh, turns out that um, first of all, so the if you adjust for the age, so you control for the age, and then the risk of death is increased among coffee drinkers. However, coffee drinkers are also more likely to smoke, and if you then also adjust for smoking status and some other potential confounders, which they don't say here, then suddenly this association between coffee consumption and mortality turns around. So it's suddenly inverse. So if you compare only people that have the same age and the same smoking status, then suddenly those that, that drink coffee have a lower mortality. So, um, so the statistical dependencies uh, 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 can sometimes hide rather complex stories. And uh, uh, another example here is uh, was a study from the German uh, Children's Cancer Register uh, that was uh, studying the uh, frequency of cancer in children close to nuclear power plants. And they found that uh, there was a significant association and the risk was, was going higher the closer you could to get to a, a power plant. Um, but at the same time, they, they say, well, uh, according to what we know, the radiation uh, is probably not the cause for this. Uh, but it could be that there are other factors or that it's just chance. Now, these other factors could be other confounders. And uh, 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 just like uh, uh, um, we had confounders uh, before um, with uh, uh, smoking, um, in this case, or, or, or other quantities that are associated, in this case, it could be, for instance, that people who live closer to nuclear power plants also systematically uh, have other differences to people that further out live further away. And uh, often these are differences, uh, a typical founder is uh, socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic variables. So it could be that uh, maybe apartments closer to nuclear power plants, are, I mean, I'm just guessing that so this is not an explanation, but a possible confounder could be these apartments are cheaper. At the same time, people who buy cheaper apartments buy lower quality food or have uh, uh, less regular medical care. So, so there are various potential reasons why those people might also get cancer more often. And these questions can be arbitrarily complicated. And uh, a, a nice article, this one's written about the difference between dependence and causation is this uh, article with the title Storks Deliver Babies. So there's a, a strong correlation between the occurrence of storks and the birth rate. Um, but uh, in European countries, but of course we wouldn't try to increase the birth rate by increasing the number of storks. So um, I think by now, uh, or you, you probably often heard this statement that uh, correlation doesn't tell us anything about causality. 
Uh, now, there are several caveats about this statement. Uh, one is that it's generally better to talk of dependence than correlation. I think we'll, we'll get back to that later. So dependence is the more general term. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, um, dependence, uh, uh, so uh, people would certainly, I think most people would agree that causality does tell us something, something about dependence. So if there's a causal link between two quantities, uh, that should generally uh, manifest itself in a dependence. Uh, but dependence also tells us something about causality. It's just a little bit more subtle uh, than equating the two things. And the first person to really formulate this uh, was uh, Hans Reichenbach, a very interesting uh, philosopher slash physicist um, who wrote a book called The Direction of Time. And in this book, he postulates the common cause principle, uh, which says that if, there are, if we have two observables that we find to be dependent, then there exists another one that causally influences both of them. So each dependence, every dependence has to have a causal explanation. And this uh, third variable can be chosen such that it screens X and Y from each other. So conditioned on this, they become independent. So it explains the whole dependence, this variable. So, uh, so that means X and Y are dependent. Then generically, this is the explanation. Uh, it could be that Z coincides with either X or Y, in which case we get one of those two graphs. So for the storks, uh, so it could be if we find this correlation, which is the, the case in Europe, it could be that the explanation is that the storks bring the babies. It could be that the babies attract the storks uh, by their shouting or something else. Or it could be that there is some other variable that has a causal influence on both. And this again could be something economic. So it could be that heavily industrialized countries uh, have lower birth rates, but also fewer storks. So uh, now, interestingly, all three models, uh, um, as we shall discuss in more details in the causality course, uh, lead to the same set of observable uh, consequences. And uh, let me see how much time I have left. Yes, I think I can go through this. Um, so this uh, one more uh, uh, slide to uh, explain how the IID assumption is, is uh, tricky and not innocuous at all. And this is uh, illustrated here with another application. So here we are shopping for a laptop rucksack and then the shop recommends uh, we, should go, we should get a laptop to go along with the rucksack. And uh, this is kind of funny. Uh, usually if I give this talk in a lecture room, people will laugh. I'm sorry, I don't hear you laughing. Maybe it's less funny via internet. But um, intuitively, uh, we would probably think, why is it funny? We would say, well, uh, uh, it should be that the, the laptop is really the, the cause for buying the rucksack in the first place. So this, there seems to be an asymmetric relationship between these two things. People don't buy a laptop because they have a laptop rucksack but they buy a rucksack because they have a laptop. Uh, now, both cause and effect, they contain information about each other. The cause, uh, because it controls the effect, and the effect, because it carries a footprint of the cause. Now, information, if measured by mutual information, is a, a symmetric uh, concept mathematically. Uh, but causality or causation seems to be asymmetric. So this, uh, uh, if we just look at mutual information, we have lost this asymmetry. And this different becomes difference. This difference is not relevant as long as you're in an IID setting, but it becomes important once we intervene in a system, uh, for instance, by recommending an item. And uh, if we just uh, blindly apply machine learning, which uh, maybe was, so this is already uh, many years old, this example, uh, this doesn't work anymore. So the, of course, these methods uh, continuously improve, but if you had blindly applied machine learning, uh, you wouldn't have detected this causality. So in a way you could say, you would have uh, uh, only uh, run a system to imitate the superficial exterior of a process a system without having any understanding of the underlying substance. So this, I have this from this uh, webpage, just discussing uh, some philosophical problems and uh, this is a statement that there was not made for machine learning, but it was made to refer to something called a cargo cult. And this is uh, uh, something that's, for instance, beautifully discussed in one of the books of Feynman. So these were uh, religious uh, practices in Pacific tribes around World War II. 
uh, these were uh, places where uh, they, they got used to receiving wealth uh, in the form of cargo delivered by airplanes uh, from, I don't know, Western countries or other countries. Uh, and then they associated certain uh, features with the cargo. Uh, uh, and these were things like uh, people waving flags at the airport or building, uh, 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 having airports. And then they started uh, building mock landing strips, et cetera, because they thought that by, by changing the variable, which, is just, which was just associated uh, with the cargo, but not causally responsible for it, uh, they could get the cargo. Now you could ask yourself, uh, is machine learning a cargo cult? Uh, and the answer is not so simple. It depends how you apply it. So the, the, the correct application of uh, machine learning to this cargo problem would be to say, we, we sample a number of Pacific islands. We, we measure if they have landing strips. We uh, measure if they have people waving flags. And uh, we also label them uh, with the amount of cargo that they receive. And then we can train a classifier based on these measurements. And then we uh, split the islands into training and test set. And then uh, sure enough, if we have a good uh, big enough training set, it's representative, the test set comes from the same distribution, we can probably uh, predict better than chance whether the, the islands in the test set do receive cargo. Now that's what we mostly do in machine learning. Uh, so uh, machine learning works great in the IID setting, uh, but the IID assumption has to hold true. So we couldn't now go and take the same system and apply it to islands somewhere else. Um, in an IID setting, machine learning makes sense. Now, uh, I gradually uh, move towards the end of the talk and um, want to give you some more general thoughts. So I talked already at the beginning about uh, this paradigm shift from energy towards information in cybernetics. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's uh, quite interesting to think about the current revolution that we are uh, undergoing, uh, sometimes called the digital revolution. And uh, think about the analogy to the, the earlier industrial revolutions. And uh, so if we think about the first industrial revolution that was uh, triggered by the steam engine and by water power, and then the second one came with electrification. So generating and transporting electrical energy. So both these revolutions, uh, even though they were a century apart or so, um, you could say they are still, they're, they're kind of part of the same the larger development uh, which was about how to generate <coughs> and convert forms of energy where, where generation, uh, you take it with a grain of salt, because if you're a physicist, or, or I think most people know that energy is conserved, you cannot generate it. You can only sort of generate one form of energy from another energy form. But the first two industrial revolutions were really about uh, uh, processing energy. And uh, the current revolution, the digital revolution, or maybe the cybernetic revolution, because I would argue it really started already mid uh, uh, 20th century, replaced energy uh, with information. So like, like, in, like energy information uh, can be processed by people. And of course, before the industrial revolutions, uh, energy was processed by people or by animals. And now uh, before our uh, uh, digital revolutions, information was processed by people. And we know that the first, first computers were actually people doing calculations. So a computer was a job description. Um, but to process information at an industrial scale, we needed uh, uh, automatic computers and now machine learning. And uh, 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 information is like energy, probably a conserved quantity. So we could probably only convert and process it and uh, I think the analogy goes further. Uh, in, uh, so the, the industrial revolutions had two phases. And I think the current one, we could also argue has two phases. And the first one was driven by computers, uh, beginning computer science, the, the first programming languages. And the second one, uh, if you want, uh, adds another source of information to the mix, just like uh, electrification added another energy form to the mix. And that's uh, uh, information that's uh, non-structures and, and weak and distributed over large data sets. And in, in order to add this to the mix, uh, you need machine learning. And uh, uh, of course, uh, I think this big picture uh, also tells us uh, that it's interesting to think about, or it's, it's our job also to think about the consequences of, of what we're doing, because uh, arguably the, the 
it's not just our energy processing abilities as humans, but it's much more our information processing abilities that make us human and that are, that are also the basis of what we are doing to this planet and how we are dominating this planet. So we are not uh, proud of being particularly good at energy processing. We're not particularly strong. We're good all around us, but, but we think we are somehow special in terms of our information processing abilities. So if this is uh, now done by, by machines, it will have major consequences. And I think we all have to work together to make sure that these are positive consequences. Okay, so um, let me, uh, I think this is already my uh, last slide. So uh, let me summarize a little bit uh, the development of the field and why I chose the, the title of the talk. So uh, I think the, uh, of course, all of, all of what we're doing builds on uh, uh, fundamental work. Uh, much of it was math mathematical works and much of this was actually done uh, in the years uh, uh, starting in the, in the 30s of the last century. So there was uh, probability theory was, uh, was finally getting axiomatized by uh, Kolmogorov, especially. <clears throat> then uh, statistics as a field, as the, the field that we know it today, was really uh, born uh, um, and developed by people like Ron Fisher, uh, who, wrote, uh, who thought about the design of experiments, who uh, uh, developed uh, something like linear discriminant analysis. Uh, the field of cybernetics started, information was mathematized, information theory was developed. So this, if you want, were the methodological foundations of, of what we are still uh, building on today. And then uh, from 1960 on, uh, AI, or the, the first works, or roughly, so this is not exact, the first works of AI were done. There was some early competition uh, between connectionism and symbolic AI. Uh, but in those days, uh, symbolic AI won this race uh, for various reasons that I try to explain. I think the XOR affair is maybe a smaller part of the reason. The bigger one is that really uh, symbolic AI was a very suitable paradigm. It had a lot of, uh, it fit very well to the digital computers and it gave birth, birth to computer science. Uh, but at the same time, at some point or uh, later on, it was realized that it has limitations when it really comes to AI. So paradoxically, it hasn't solved the AI problem. It's done something huge with computer science, uh, but the AI problem remained unsolved. And uh, motivated by, by this, uh, uh, from roughly around the 90s, uh, statistical AI was beginning to take over. Yeah, so this gave uh, stronger foundations in probability. Um, um, it uh, came with the backpropagation algorithm. It added a number of other things uh, to the mix. And this is basically where we stand now. And now I, I remember <clears throat> I was once in a talk uh, by Vladimir Vatnik, who was my PhD advisor, and he was talking about the history of the development of the field. And I think that, uh, there was a slide that said some, something like the great 1930s, and he talked about Kolmogorov, and then the, the great 1960s, and that uh, uh, there he talked about the development of statistical learning theory. So here we have, for instance, the, the, I think one of the first books of Vatnik and Chamuininkas in the Russian original, and there was the theory of uniform convergence and uh, VC dimension, etc. So the great 30s, the great 60s, and then the great uh, 90s uh, was the next in his list. And the great 90s, of course, uh, for Vladimir was uh, uh, support vector machines, kernel methods. And then on the next slide, and he, so he gave that talk around 2000. Uh, the next slide, he suddenly said the great 2000s, and everybody was laughing because <laughs> there was this nice progression of 30 years, but Vladimir wanted to uh, talk about the presence. Now, the great thing is by now it's 2020, so we can talk about the great 2020s, uh, but I'm not going to try and tell you what it is. But, uh, but in the next lecture, I will try to explain and with Stefan Bauer. So we are splitting this course and I will talk about it today, Stefan, tomorrow. Uh, trying to argue <clears throat> one direction that might be this next step. And, and you could argue that I tried that today, just like the, the XOR affair uh, you know, was, a, was a crucial part in this. And when this field started, uh, maybe we say the IID affair or the limitations, uh, 
IID limitations of statistical AI uh, could really be the motivation and the starting point for, for the next step, uh, form of uh, causal or interventional AI. So, and with that, I would like to thank you very much. So here are some, some references. So um, <clears throat> we wanted to um, show you a little video before the next talk. Uh, I think the video is about five minutes, but uh, that means if you want, we could also take a few uh, comments or questions now, or how, how shall we run this, Mijung? Yeah, we have about nine minutes left before two. Um, if you have any questions, raise your hand. Okay. Otherwise, it's also fine to show the video and then move to the next talk and then people can interrupt when they want. So I'm, I'm easy either way. Because this, this is more of an intro. Uh, maybe people don't have so many questions about this. There was one person. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a question. I see it here. Yeah. Did you say that information is conserved the way energy is? Um, Yes, I, I said that, but <clears throat> I cannot say it with certainty. So I, I mean, I was, I studied physics originally, but I wouldn't claim that I really uh, understand the current state in this discussion. I realized, so that's so one answer is uh, uh, the, the time evolution in quantum mechanics is uh, a unitary one and therefore uh, doesn't generate or destroy information. Now, of course, quantum mechanics is maybe not the full story and people ask questions like, what happens if something uh, falls into a black hole? So if you throw information into a black hole, for black holes, there's something called the no hair theorem or no hair hypothesis, which says that the black hole doesn't have uh, any properties apart from very few uh, ones, uh, namely, I think the mass, the angular momentum and the charge. So if you have specified these three numbers, then you know everything there is to know about a black hole, a stationary black hole in its... Uh, uh, so uh, if you throw information into the black hole, it, it would seem like the information is gone, uh, but that's, that's being debated and it's not clear whether it's somehow still there in the event horizon, or maybe it's an artifact from just considering the steady state. So I think by and large, physicists seem to think information is conserved uh, but I think this is a, a fascinating problem too. And I think we don't really understand it to the same level that we understand uh, uh, the conservation of energy. And you know, uh, uh, the people, uh, I think people had a hunch or some form of understanding that, elect uh, that uh, energy is conserved uh, already for quite some time. Uh, but arguably the real understanding could say only came through uh, Noether's theorem. So there was this uh, famous mathematician, Emmy Noether, uh, who proved a theorem connecting uh, the uh, uh, conservation of energy, or not just of energy, also momentum and, and angular momentum. So uh, who, who, the theorem basically proves that if you have a certain type of uh, uh, Lie group symmetry for your equations of motion, then this implies a, a certain law of conservation. And that gave us uh, finally, one could say, the, the modern understanding of why energy is conserved. And it would be great to have a same kind of, uh, similar kind of explanation for why information is conserved. And if you have a good idea how to do that, please talk to me. It, I'd be interested in this problem for 10 years or so. Uh, any more questions? So there's something about, uh, let's see, how are we doing on time? We have about six minutes. Because we have to show the video also now, right? Yes, yes. So should we just start the video and let's, let's maybe- do the video first, yeah. Questions in the next session. Okay. Yeah. So do we, will you play it or should I play it from here? Uh, I can play it. Uh, just one quick uh, announcement. So we will move to another Zoom session, which will start. we will start soon after this video. So please um, go to the next session and we will see you soon after but, this. But the video will play in this Here. room, yeah. right? Okay, so watch the video and then we'll see you again in the next session. Okay, thanks. Um, do you see the whole thing? How are they gonna make this session?
Bob, Ovdje Martin, pozdrav iz Amerike. Hello, my name is Kathy and I'm joining from Vancouver. Buongiorno, I'm Mark. I'm joining from the UK. Hi, I'm Margaret and I'm joining from the UK. Good morning, Kathy. Salut. Sunt Victor și particip din Legatul Unii. I'm joining from the United States. Ahoj, ce pripravim sa za Slovenska. Sari, sme Brigo Iša, Vision Fest. Hello, nech tu mi, to nech 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 nech. So, Iša, ako te je na taktu je Iša. Hi, and I'm joining from Heidelberg. We have the yellow state. Yellow! Hello, we have the yellow state. 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 Super content de participer à MLSS 2020. Je vous remercie de MLSS 2020. Oui, je vous remercie de MLSS 2020. Hi, I'm joining from Surrey, near London. Bonjour, je suis Chloé et je participe de Finnerman. Ciao, sono Maura Pintor e mi connetto da Cagliari, Italia. Ciao, 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 I'm looking forward to learning machine learning and having many interesting discussions with you all. I'm looking forward to learning machine learning and I'm looking forward to learning machine learning and having many interesting discussions with you all. I'm looking forward to learning machine learning and having many interesting discussions with you all. Je suis impatient d'apprendre le machine learning avec vous tous et d'avoir des conversations avec vous. Le machine learning c'est quelque chose qui est absolument très intéressant et qui est très intéressant. Salut, j'ai hâte d'apprendre de machine learning et d'avoir plein de discussions intéressantes avec vous tous. Salut, je suis Mathieu, je suis un modèle d'un modèle de santé pour essayer de faire des machines, c'est mon espèce. Je suis un de ma vie et je suis un de ma vie. Bonjour, je suis Fanny et j'ai envie de participer à un MNSS avec toi. Je suis un peu plus de machine learning pour apprendre de plus intéressantes discussions avec vous. Hello, I'm going to switch to the session. Salut, je m'appelle Antoine, et je vous protège depuis Lyon, depuis Belle Ville de France. Oh, oui, madame, je suis à l'essai, je vais vous laisser à l'essai, je vais vous laisser à l'essai. Le Zippo Press, que nous sommes dans ce livre, c'est quelqu'un qui est soutenu, qui est très simple, qui est très simple. Je crois que je trouve que j'ai bien mis ça, mais je crois que c'est un peu plus de temps. Hi, I'm Johnny from the UK. E aí, eu sou de São Paulo, Brasil. Eu gosto de ver o Xi Jinping. Há dois anos, eu não sei se ele está vivo. 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 Есть нетерпение между возможностью изучить машинное обучение, принять участие в увлекательном процессе вместе с вами. Salut tout le monde, je m'appelle Rémi Leluc et je viens de Paris, en France. This guy is awesome. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess we will turn on the next session and 